Danny J. And I'm Jill Coleman. Welcome to the Best Life Podcast. Here, we talk about everything from success, money, relationships, and entrepreneurship to productivity, honest communication, positive psychology, and how to cultivate an abundance mindset. Make money, travel the world, deepen your relationships, live full out. This is the best life. Welcome back to the Best Life Podcast. This is Danny J and Jill Coleman. Uh, we are so excited to have another episode sponsored by our amazing sponsor, Organifi. We're, Jill and I travel a lot, and so what's really amazing is that we have these little greens travel packets, which are super helpful to bring on the road because you can't really bring big powders in your suitcase. And um, I wanted to share something that I actually learned from my dear mother. She took the greens and she heated it up like tea and was drinking it at night and I thought it was a really good idea. So I did this and it was so delicious. So anyway. Well, you know, one of the things about, uh, well, obviously sometimes it's so hard when you're traveling to get greens in yeah, or get any vegetables really. So that's why I love it. And uh, a couple of people were asking us, so Organifi, we want to make sure that people know that it has an I at the end and not a Y. Oh yeah. So it's spelled, just spell it out, but it's F-I at the end. And then use the best life, all one word to get your 20% off discount if you do want to get greens and reds and make that green tea latte thingy that you made. Yeah. You need to make that for me. I know. It's so good. I've been heating it up and then I bought a little milk steamer thingy and I made a, made a green tea latte out of it. So that's amazing. And I just want to say before we get started on today's uh, episode, which I'm super pumped about, you and I have had this conversation so many times with each other. And I think those end up being the best podcast. So the feedback that we've gotten on the first few podcasts have been absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you guys so much for the reviews, for the messages, for the DMs, for the emails. It really means so much to us. And like literally we're crying like pretty much every day reading <laughs> yes. them, just yes. tearing up, hearing that many of you have had similar experiences or and even if you haven't, feeling like you can relate to a lot of what we've Said. And I think it ha- it worked really well because you and I have had all those conversations with each other, of mm-hmm. course, over the last couple of years. So it came off really natural. And that was the feedback that I got, that it's super conversational. And I, we just want to say thank you guys for giving us that. Yeah. And just taking the conversation online too, out of this, out of this medium, just on our platforms and in the reviews, it's just been really cool to hear your guys' stories as well. And we're glad that you can relate and that they're helpful and we hope to keep serving that way. Yep. So we love talking about relationships, which we've done quite a bit so far, and we're going to continue to do that. But today we want to talk about, and just switch gears a tiny bit, we want to talk about food obsession, yo-yo dieting, and sometimes the, the kind of mindset struggles that come along with not only the physiological struggles of yo-yo dieting. You and I have a lot of again, similar storyline when it comes to this, maybe a little bit more extreme than most people because we did end up doing figure competitions, getting up on stage, dieting for, you know, photo shoots and things like that. I think you were a little bit more in that space than I was, but for the majority of our twenties, that was the lifestyle that we lived, this kind of binge or deprive lifestyle. So we, we get a lot of questions about this. As you guys know, both Danny and I eat moderately and moderation or moderation 365 uh, which is my nutrition philosophy is not always easy sometimes all or nothing feels a little bit easier so we kind of program jump we want a new meal plan we want to get a coach who seemingly has the best program has the best meal plan and all of that at least for us was a huge trap and we want to talk about our stories and how we kind of yanked ourselves out of that yeah you know it's funny when you said uh, we're going to switch gears on, on talking about relationships. As you were saying that, I thought, you know, this really is about another relationship. It's our relationship with food. Yep. It's our relationship with how we are around it, what it means to us, the meanings that we put behind our meals and what it does to our body. So I'm really excited because I think this is such a deep topic. And it's just a topic that for women especially, is it goes deep. And there are some deep-rooted things in this. And Jill and I have been down the black hole of the food obsession and it's not fun. So yeah, let's start with your story. And I'm actually curious too. I wrote this down to ask you about how you saw your mom growing up because I was wondering if anything was modeled when, so tell Mm -hmm. us your story, but then I'm wondering about your modeling growing up. Yeah. So interestingly, I grew up kind of on a junk food diet. Not, I mean, mom, I'm sure, I don't think my mom would listen to this podcast, but I just (laughs) want, I don't want her to feel sensitive about this because she was a great mom, but she was a single mom for many years. And because of that, she was full-time working and she was, uh, you know, extremely 
amazing example of work ethic and someone who did their best and showed up and was a grinder and that's I totally took that but we did a lot of TV dinners we did a lot of lunchables that kind of thing a lot of convenient type foods I liked plastic food you know growing up I liked Cheez-Its and I liked fluff and nutter and if you guys are familiar <laughs> with this stuff you know I was I candy and soda and stuff like that so you know but I was always an athlete so yeah. growing up as an athlete, you kind of could eat whatever you wanted. So I would eat a lot of pasta, bread. I didn't ever really think about food growing up. I ate whatever I wanted because I always burned it off. That lasted until uh, through college actually. And it wasn't until I had been a year out of school when I had been doing a lot of 5Ks and half marathons and triathlons. And I said, you know what, I wonder if I could do a figure competition. I was reading Oxygen Magazine at the time, Muscle and Fitness Hers, and I wondered, you know, I know that looks tough. I've never paid attention to my nutrition before, so this would be something completely different. And I can say hands down that the first time I did the competition diet, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Totally different way of, of eating. And it was the first time that I, started, I counted and I was measuring and I was aware of even, honestly, if you'd asked me back then, like how many carbs were in chicken breast, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell you. Yeah. I know that's crazy, right? Because um, I ended up getting a degree in nutrition later on, but I did not pay attention to it. Funny story, when Jade and I, our very first date we ever went on was out to breakfast and I just ordered like a huge stack of pancakes. <laughs> I mean, and not that pancakes are bad, and of course, like every once in a while, we want to do that. But I mean, I had, I just was like, I was someone who ordered whatever they wanted yeah. on the menu anytime, yeah. whatever is the most delicious. Did not take into consideration that. So I started doing competitions, and something really interesting happened after my first show. I lost about twenty five pounds, got up on stage, was getting a ton of affirmation from people at my gym mm -hmm. and people seeing me. I was spending money on clothes in size fours and stuff like that. I've never worn them before. And I think in my head I just thought that once I lost this weight that I would just keep it off. Yep. And that's so silly to think about now, but I think that I just assumed that, you know, after the show was over, I didn't even think about it. I was so focused on that one day that I didn't think about what my strategy was going to be afterwards. And honestly, no one in Oxygen Magazine was talking about no. what happens after you step off stage and how do you reintroduce some of these foods and how do you reintroduce more carbohydrates and water even. And so I started eating everything in sight. Of course, because I was so deprived, I was so depleted, how could I not? So I remember I just stuffed my face for like two weeks straight and I gained 15 pounds in two weeks. And I remember looking at my body and not even recognizing it because yeah. I had spent so long, so many months getting super shredded for the show. I ended up winning the show, but I gained back 15 pounds within two weeks. And I remember being so angry at myself and so devastated and so ashamed yeah. walking around town and seeing the exact same people who had been all about, oh my God, you're losing weight and you look amazing. And when's your show? Now I'm not getting those comments anymore, yeah. right? I'm not getting that kind of affirmation. People aren't asking me. I'm feeling like, man, they're judging me. Mm -hmm. And of course they probably were. Sure. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I'm wearing men's large Hanes t-shirts around town trying to like hide my body. And I remember just going, okay, I need to get that feeling back. I need to get back the affirmation that I was getting. Yeah. And so I said the only way that I could do that, I was feeling in my power and in control when I was on that competition diet, that extreme diet. And I said, I got to do another show. And within another three or four months, I did a second show. And that was the beginning of it for me. The next five to six years, it was all defined by diet start dates, show dates, photo shoot days, and then how I could, quote, prep for those things as I was getting closer. I always had a date on my calendar of when the diet had to start. The idea that I, I would eat the same year round was so crazy to me. I was either prepping for something, and if I wasn't prepping for something, I was eating whatever I wanted anytime. And that was many years of yo-yo dieting, and it took a huge toll on my metabolism. As a trainer, I remember so many women coming to do shows over and over just to basically have a goal. That's it. Because it was like a weight loss system. Yeah, they were so worried about getting the weight back. They're going, I need to do a show again. I need to do a show again. And that's a really big trap that people can get into or some kind of event. It, and I even did this with 5Ks. I, I was getting tired of working out, so I'd have to give myself a goal. Something to train for because otherwise I didn't know what the point, why I was training because I was just tired and I was exhausted. Yeah, you had this total just like, you know, you needed that goal in order to yeah. keep yourself, quote, in line. And if you didn't have that, you ate with the bandits. Actually, ironically, you asked about my mom because I remember 
so funny, and I give her so much credit for this. She was actually a normal eater. She had no issues around food. Mm-hmm. She had a sweet tooth, like most of us do. But one of the funniest things was I was actually visiting her up in Boston, and I was getting ready to do a competition in Rhode Island. And so I was bringing all my food with me, uh-huh. and we were in the mall parking lot, and I was like, okay, I have to eat really quick. And I pulled out this like disgusting Tupperware of ground turkey, 99% lean ground turkey, this like salsa that I had. And I mixed it all, and we're literally in a garage parking lot, and I'm mixing it all together and, like, eating it cold. And my mom just goes, like, she was so, to someone who's, quote, normal eater, that seems so weird. And she was like, if you just didn't exercise like you do, you wouldn't have to eat all that. If you didn't eat all that, you wouldn't have to exercise as much. And it was. It became this cycle of I need to exercise more so I can burn off the calories Mm -hmm. that I'm eating, but because I'm exercising so much, my cravings and hunger are through the roof. It's so funny. It's interesting. I asked you about your mom because I we hadn't actually discussed this. So we have a very similar story with the competition. But my food stuff started way earlier than yeah. yours. I actually remember probably, I'm thinking I was... I was maybe around eight years old when I really started worrying about my weight and dieting. My mom was always on a diet and my grandmother was always on a diet. My grandmother was actually probably close to 300 pounds and my parents got divorced and we ended up living with them. And my grandmother always had slim fast. She'd have these little boxes and bars in her office. She was going to Jenny Craig. I mean, any diet that came up, she would do it. And for me, I thought my mom at the time was very just beautiful and she was like my hero as you know little girls looking up to their mom and she was dating and she was really pretty and she was always dieting too so I would go and like sneak sips of diet coke because she they both drank a lot of diet sodas I would sneak sips of diet coke because I thought like diet drinks or diet foods would basically make you lose weight right like they <laughs> would just eat more I the thought the you. food yeah like they were fat burning foods or something. <laughs> I don't even know what fat burning was I didn't even really know what dieting was I just knew that they were always trying to be skinnier and I thought that was what women did it was the women in my life that I looked up to I thought they were perfect as they were and I thought well they're just they're dieting that's what you're supposed to do when you're a grown-up kind of like when little girls put on makeup because they see their older sisters or parents doing makeup so I was constantly doing like sneaking some of their diet foods. I remember grandmother had slim fast bars and they were just chalky, like the old protein bars. They were super chalky. And I snuck into her office and I would steal some slim fast bars and just eat them like underneath the desk or something. So it was really early for me. And then of course I was a gymnast. And when I was 13 years old, our coaches started weighing Mm. us. They decided that everybody, a lot of the girls that were going into our competition um, seasons, we were all going through puberty. So everybody was starting to gain weight. And this is a time where it's just your body's doing whatever it's doing. So unfortunately, it became a weekly thing. Every Monday, we would have to go in. Uh, in front of each other and get on the scale and our coach would write it down and it was really embarrassing and that was a point where I really started to be very self-aware in front of other people and not only that they started making us have no biker days which basically was we had leotards and then biker shorts and one day a week we couldn't wear biker shorts which was a safety net for me because I was embarrassed by my butt and I thought my cellulite was showing and so why did you why was there a day that you couldn't wear the biker shorts was it to keep you like Slim? No, it was it was one of two things to keep us slim, but also because when we did competitions, we weren't allowed to wear them, and they wanted us to get used to not Got picking it. our wedgies in public, like <laughs> if we were on stage or performing or competing. So I was really embarrassed. I was starting to be really self aware of my body, and uh, I just that year I started making myself throw up. Um, I was I hurt. I, I don't know. I saw. I learned it from watching probably Dr. Phil or some show. You know, it was supposed to be, of course, shows about self-awareness to look for the warning signs, but instead that's where I learned it. And yeah, I started making myself throw up. I remember the girls on Mondays, right before we would weigh in, we would try not to eat all day. So we would weigh the least that day. And I became really obsessed with the number on the scale and really obsessed with, with food then. And I actually started competing in a way to, I saw girls in the oxygen magazines looking at their bodies and I thought, wow, I want to look like that. And... I thought it was really cool that you could manipulate your food in order to make your body look that way. And I started to do the competition dieting. And for me, that was actually more freedom because I was actually able to eat before. I was so terrified of food. Didn't know, didn't trust myself to eat the right things. Didn't know what to eat. I was throwing up all the time. And this was finally a time where I could eat and I stopped throwing up. So I thought, I've cured myself. I don't have an eating disorder anymore because I'm eating all the time. Um, no, you, but, have a, you just have a mindset disorder. Totally. <laughs> totally. So, I mean, ultimately, it turned into 
um, like you said, it was a control thing totally. and it was, it was a way to be able to, I never felt safe around food still, but at least I had these rules I could follow and it was, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. And I will tell you probably for seven years, I could have counted on one hand the times I ever ate off quote unquote plan, something different. Even when I was not competing for you, and I know a lot of women after the show, they would have the weight yeah. gain and freak out and then go back. Yeah. For me, I was so terrified of that. I would even eat like on plan when it was off season. I would not change anything. And that was why my body ended up really getting messed up with my adrenal fatigue and everything because I stayed strict all the time. And it just really was an obsession since I was a little girl. And I, uh, I think that I wanted to talk about this was you know, it's never really about the food, is it, right? It comes down to a lot of other things. And so I've had people say, well, um, I have food issues. I think I actually did a YouTube video years ago called You Don't Have Food Issues. And it's like, you don't have food issues. You have other issues. And what, what are they? And this is the question. Like, what are the issues? Why are you um, using this for control? Why are you trying to manipulate the food? Um, but it's But it's real. It's scary. It feels like you can't be around something that you need. And this is one of the things with when it comes down to food is that you can't not have it. It's not like a drug addiction or cigarettes. You don't have to smoke to live, but you do have to eat to live. And so you have to find a way that you can eat, but it's not ruling your life. Yeah. And yeah. I love that you mentioned control because in that it's not always, it's not about the weight. It's not about a number on a scale. It's about... Mm -hmm controlling and and like you I love the idea of what I put in my body mm -hmm. gets to change the way I look and the way that I look uh you know creates certain responses from people in the world right so for example maybe I'm more lovable or I'm more attractive to a potential partner or people uh, at the gym respect me more or you know people want to know ask me questions about what I'm doing and so for me it became controlling my people's perception of me yeah if I have a quote unquote the perfect body then that means that I'm good enough. And when I had those times where I was not in quote show shape, or I had seen at the leanness I could be, when I wasn't there, I didn't feel good enough. And so obviously this is so big. And I think a lot of people have different ways that their not good enoughness shows up. Mm -hmm. For me, it started in the body stuff. Mm -hmm. Then if you kind of work through your relationship with food, and we'll talk more about how to do that in a second, you can work through that and it can still show up in your business. Yep. It can still show up in your money mindset. It can still show up in your relationship. We talked about this when we talked about the infidelity stuff. A lot of that for me was if someone chooses me, then I get to be good enough, right? This one person chose me, this, you know, we're this, this couple. And so again, it can translate into other areas if you don't do the hard work on yourself, which comes down to things like self-compassion, being gentle with yourself, being honest, having awareness, negative self-talk, and speaking of negative self-talk, this is something, I don't know if you experienced this, but I didn't really understand that. Like, I didn't understand as a concept. I was just doing it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us don't know that we're doing it until we look back and go like, wow, I really have a lot of guilt and shame and, and mentally beating myself up. I remember so many times when I got ready to start another competition diet, I would say, God, Jill, why did you let yourself go? Why did you let yourself slip? Now look how far you have to go. You if you had over. just stayed in shape, if you had yeah. just not eaten all the stuff. I remember like sneaking food and then being so mad at myself. I had this so random, this, you know, organic cookie like four days before my show from Whole Foods. <laughs> and I, and it wasn't even good. And I hated that it wasn't good. I was yeah. like, I wasted it. Yeah. And so before you know it, I talk to women all the time and I know you do too. We don't know that we're even dealing with this stuff until we're like, holy shit, how do we get here? Yeah. You know, how do we get here that we're scared of things like fruit and nuts and, you know, dairy products? Like, how did we get to a point where we can't even have fruit? Yeah. And it becomes obsessive. And so I don't know if this is as extreme. Maybe if you're listening to this, you're like, wow, these girls have problems. We did have problems. But, <laughs> but it was unlearning all of that. Yes. Because you go so far down the rabbit hole without knowing it. And then you go, how can I unlearn these bad habits? How can I unlearn this obsessive thoughts about food and about rules and about being good enough if I can, quote unquote, follow the plan or have the perfect body? Yeah. It's it's one of those things where, like you said, the awareness, you don't have the awareness as it's happening. No. For for my example, as a child, when you're just, you're seeing it modeled and you're, you're around people where it's it's okay, you're being weighed by the, I was in gymnastics six days a week, four hours a day. I was high level com competitive gymnast. So 
this was my life. I didn't know any different. Right. And so a lot of times I think we just have, obviously society puts a lot of stuff on us and it, we just get to a point where we're going, wait, did I even choose this? Is this, right. and thoughts in your head just come up. It's like, you didn't even realize you were talking to yourself. And way. there's affirmations though. Remember, like we'll sit here and be like, oh, it's so miserable. But you know what? There were times it was really awesome. And yeah. I think for me, I loved the feeling of being in control. I love the feeling of having that body when I had it. I love the feeling of getting the approval and the affirmation yeah. that I had in those moments. I love feeling better than yeah. at times. I like the self-righteousness that came with being able to, quote, be disciplined yeah. and look around and go, wow, no one else is doing this kind of take as much sacrifice as I have yeah. is, you know, putting their, you know, doing this as dedicated as I am. So there were times like there's a reason why you become addicted to that because there's these glimpses where you just feel on top of the world. Yeah. I think that the competition diet gave me that. It made me feel in control. It made me feel like I fixed my eating disorder. It made me feel like I knew exactly what to do. You had to figure it out. When I had numbers, this was the thing too. It was very scientific. So for me, there was a right was interview. Yeah, I was going. I was like, look, I would weigh my food. I knew exactly how many macros of protein, carbs, and fats every day. And I remember getting the calculator out and being so proud of myself if I could get the percentages just right to yeah. whatever I decided that they were going to be or supposed to be. And I had these books, and I wrote down every single thing I put in my mouth. I wrote the calories, the proteins, the fats. At the bottom, I'd have my totals. Feel so organized. It was so organized. And you know what's funny, too? Sometimes I would sneak something in, but I would omit it from my journal like I, I knew it went in my mouth but I didn't even want to admit it to myself I didn't want it in writing to like you know because then it would just <laughs> somehow, be proof that you weren't perfect yeah right in and front would, of your face it would mess up my math it would mess it all up so I'm going okay that didn't happen yes you don't write it down it's the calories don't count right <laughs> so how did you what was the moment that you realized that something was wrong, mm -hmm. that's a little bit different than maybe the moment you realized you want to do something different. Yeah. So was there a moment where you were like, okay, I'm noticing this is happening. I don't like it, but I'm terrified to do anything different. Yeah. A couple moments, obviously, you know, from the massive eating disorder stuff, going into fitness competitions, obviously I knew there was a problem then. I was going to meetings. I was trying to go to, um, Overeaters Anonymous. My parents were going to send me to an eating disorder clinic. So I always knew I struggled with food, but the, the things I tried back then, counseling. It just wasn't working. So then the dieting quote unquote worked until it didn't. Suddenly I started gaining weight, even though I was eating all the, the right stuff. things. And even though I was working out two, three hours a day and like Jill's story where she gained 15 pounds rapidly, I gained 30 pounds in two months and I had been eating perfectly to the T doing about two hours of cardio a day. I was exhausted and I could not figure out why because I was doing it all right. I was doing it by the book. And I went to a doctor and I was going, something's wrong. And I, I wanted to punch this guy. He goes, well, you maybe just need to eat less and work out more. And I was like, I could show you the handwritten, like everything I've eaten in the last seven years. Don't tell me eat less and work out more. I, at that point, was probably eating 900 to 1,000, oh, wow. 1100 calories a day. He had no idea, and I left that doctor's office feeling so defeated. And I just thought something's wrong. I got, you know, I, my thyroid's off. Something is off. I need labs, and I got the labs back. Everything was fine. They couldn't find anything. And probably for two years, I really struggled with that. And it ultimately came down to the point where I, speaking of negative thoughts, I was getting on the scale every day, and I literally said, if I hit 130 pounds, I'm going to kill myself. And then, like, I was thinking that would motivate me to stop, right? And I got there. And then I go, okay. It happened really fast. I was like, okay, if I get 140 pounds, I'm going to kill myself. And this is so terrible. And that happened so quick, like, within a week. And I'm going, I can't just kill myself. So then I go, okay, if I get to 150. Like, literally, I'm thinking this is motivate. This is going to motivate me. If I tell myself I'm going to kill myself, I can't. Well, so I think we're all glad that you didn't kill yourself. <laughs> so stupid. So I get to 150 and that was where I was like, I don't want to get on the scale anymore. And I went, I cried in my room. And at this point we were living with some friends of ours and it was already a really bad time in my life. And I thought, well, I'm working out really hard. I'm eating so strict and I'm gaining weight. I might as well, if I'm going to gain weight anyway, I might as well just enjoy it. So I literally would just said, fuck it. 
and I'm going to eat whatever I want and stop training and I'm going to get up to 200 pounds. My husband's <laughs> going to leave me and my life is going to be over, but whatever. And I just, in my head, real just thought I was going to turn into this massive, unattractive blimp that nobody will want, nobody would love, and I would just disappear into the wherever, like live in a hole. So I went out to the grocery store. I bought two or three bags of those chocolate raisins and I ate all of them. And then I made a big bowl of spaghetti and I ate it at 10 o'clock at night, which was crazy because I never ate carbs after like four. And the next morning I got up and got on the scale and I was the same, which made me go, what the heck? Because all the other days I was getting on the scale, I was going up and up and up and up, even if it was by half a pound. So I thought that's really odd. Um, and I had told myself not to get on the scale. I did it because I just was like, yeah, let's just do this. So it was really that point where I was going, well, I didn't gain any. That was weird. And I went through a long phase, and this was not easy, but I went through this long phase of just deciding I'm going to eat whatever. I cannot do this anymore. And I started to think, about little kids. I started coaching gymnastics again at this point. I was looking at these little girls going, they're not worried about what they're eating. They would bring in just junk food, like how you said mm -hmm. when you were a kid. They're athletes, they're eating junk, they're burning it off. And I was just staring at these like little girls, like eight, nine, 10 years old, going, gosh, it would be nice to be a kid and not think about this. And their bodies are working and their bodies aren't. And I'm going, our bodies must know. Our bodies must be able to take care of it. But I did not trust my own body. I was afraid of my own body. My body was my enemy. And I just kept trying to trust that my body would know. And I'll tell you more like when we go through some of the tools, some of the things I did, but ultimately it was just a fuck it point. I ate everything and I didn't die and I didn't blow up. And that was where it started for me to just start to slowly trust myself and sit through really, really uncomfortable feelings where I would eat something I quote unquote wouldn't be for, or like shouldn't or was bad and just sit with it and not throw it up and not do any compensatory behavior like cardio, like just sit with it. It was uncomfortable all the time, but I did it more and more and more. It wasn't perfect, but it just was a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And I had a little bit of a similar story in terms of seeing evidence that like it was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think before you know that you're really scared. Yeah. If you're listening to this and you're like, well, you know, competitions, I've never done one. I don't know what that's like. This can be, we've talked to thousands of women who have never maybe done a competition, but I've done excessive dieting, obsessive dieting, yo-yo dieting, jumping from meal plan to meal plan, doing this cleanse, doing this jump start, doing this, you know, some sort of just really strict program or even something like Weight Watchers or anything like that. If you have done consistent dieting in your adult life, then this, hopefully some of this is resonating with you. One of the things that I hear a lot from women is just the obsessive thoughts, the counting, the measuring. And so one of the things to, to, for, to remember about this is that it's not just the time that it takes making the food. That can be if you're eating a quote five, like, you know, five times a day, right? You're either like buying food, prepping food, eating food, making food, washing dishes because you just ate. And then you're immediately thinking about the next meal. The next you're meal. going, how many more minutes until I can eat again? And you know, well, what, what am I going to have for dinner? And it's just this constant reel in your mind about when you're going to eat next, what time, what food, is there going to be enough? All these kind of like feelings of there's not going to be enough and FOMO and are we going to be missing out and all that kind of stuff. And so even if you've never done a competition diet, I think that a lot of us can relate to those kind of feelings. Mm -hmm. And so when you move to something like moderation or eating kind of the same every day, a lot of what happens is it feels disorienting because you're not thinking about food as much anymore. So not only is it not taking you as much time to maybe make the food and eat the food, but you're not thinking about it 24 seven and that feels disorienting. It feels like, is this okay? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, is this, am I not working hard enough? Cause I know for me, if things felt easy, it meant I could do more. I should be doing more. I should be dieting harder. I should do more cardio. This can't just be easy. Yeah. And so there's this little piece when you start to make that shift into like, okay, I guess this is fine. You've never experienced this before, but this sense of ease and like, wow, I don't have to, and I can still maintain, I can, my genes can still fit. Even if I'm not thinking about this stuff that much, People have said to me in the past that moderation feels like failure. 
they feel like if they're not doing something that's a diet or they're not quote on a plan Mm -hmm. that they feel like it's failure. They're not trying hard enough. And so for me, my moment was very similar to yours. It was a super fuck it moment. It was a moment after I had dieted very consistently. For me, I was doing a lot of yo-yo dieting, but I had done like nine months straight mm-hmm. of like hardcore dieting. I had like six or so, something photo shoots and shows. And I remember finishing up my last photo shoot and I, I know exactly where I was. And I had this like thought in my head, wow, I'm not, I don't have any other events on my calendar. I don't have any photo shoots. I don't have any you know, cause for me, everything was defined by a deadline. Yeah. I have this many weeks to get ready for this thing all the time. And so I always like, just reverse engineered that. Okay. I have 12 weeks. Okay. Now I have eight weeks. Now I have six weeks. How much cardio? And so when I didn't have anything else on my calendar to look forward to or to prep for, I remember saying to myself, I have to figure out how to do this forever. Mm-hmm. I have to figure out how to eat forever. Cause this, I can't do this anymore. And I was also so disgusted by the dieting food that I was eating, mm-hmm. so grossed out by the egg whites. I still have PTSD from asparagus. <laughs> you know the asparagus. And so I remember just going, you know what? I'm just not making my food this week. I'm just not prepping my food on Sundays, which was just, I couldn't imagine having not done that. Yeah. You know, I just said, I'm not, fuck this. I'm definitely not going to cook my food. I don't even care if I end up at the McDonald's drive through every meal. I don't care if I gain 50 pounds, yep. just like you. I don't care if I gain 50 pounds because that's honestly what I thought was going to happen because yep. I was giving up that locus of control. And I remember I didn't eat perfectly, but I had protein bars and protein shakes and maybe some takeout salads and, you know, uh, some like quick eggs or just like cheese and, and nuts, handfuls of nuts. And I'm at the end of the week and my clothes still fit yeah. and I survived. Yeah. And that was the first time that I had quote, like relinquished control yeah. and been like, wow, like it, it was, it worked, yep. you know, and then you see that evidence yep. that you don't gain all that weight that you thought you were going to, or yeah. just completely go off the deep end. And I think for both of us having that experience is like, okay, that gives you a little bit of confidence yep. that you can do something else. Well, we had trained our body to put on weight pretty quickly because of the deprivation too. Totally. So I think that sometimes when people get to the place where they go, well, Danny, Jill, I want to do that, but I am going to gain all that weight, you know, right. I will blow up. Well, you're probably going to gain a little bit. Yeah, you might gain for a little bit. And I, you know, I did. I stayed at that top weight for a little while and it took a few years to go back down and normalize, but I never dieted. It went really, really slow. And I'm so glad that I, that I never went back to the dieting, but it's very difficult. And you do have to sit in those really uncomfortable places for a while where your body just doesn't feel great for a little bit, where maybe your clothes are a little tighter. And I got advice from some girl can't even remember who, but she just told me just wear sweatpants for the next couple months. And it was probably the best (laughs) advice because I was so just embarrassed. And so I go, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to worry about trying to put any jeans on. I'm not even going to try on any of my clothes. They probably did fit, but I was so terrified. So I just stayed in, in stretch pants for a while because I needed to not obsess about it and not cry about it and not think about it. And so I just had to give myself that quote unquote being frumpy for a little while yep. to get through And I, it. that's such a good point because it does normalize. Some people always say, well, I'm really, I really want to try moderation. I really want to do this, but I'm, I really am scared I'm going to gain. And mm-hmm. the bottom line is you probably will gain. Like for me, I probably gained about five to seven pounds. Mm-hmm. But to your point, it does normalize. Your body doesn't just keep going, going, yeah. going, unless you're like stuffing your face constantly, which you won't. Yeah. Because you'll start to learn this practice and this process. So how does that look? What does moderation look like? Yeah. I think for both of us, we either had an on or an off switch. That was it. I only knew black or white, all or nothing. Yeah. So the idea that you're going to eat moderately means that you're never doing that super strict diet again, but you're also not eating with abandon either. So how do you, and by the way, moderation is so much harder than all or nothing because you, there are no rules, right? There's no rules. It's kind of like you have to pay attention to your hunger cues and your cravings and your energy and, and you're taking into account how your body feels and what foods feel like in your body before. It was just like, tell me what to eat instead of actually eating something and then going, oh, it didn't sit well with me. Or do I even like this food? Most of us are dieting. Don't even ask ourselves, like, do I even like asparagus? I just made myself eat the stuff that's. Someone told me to eat. Yeah. And so taking into consideration you, your unique metabolism, your personal preferences, your psychological sensitivities, your schedule, all those kind of things feels really big. So people go, well, that sounds great, Jill, but I'd rather just do the all or nothing thing so I don't have to think about it. Yeah. The problem with that is you're going to be struggling for a lot longer. Moderation, in order to learn it, takes time up front. 
But once you do the work, you literally never think about food. I mean, how often do you think about food, really? No. I like, mean, when I'm ever. hungry. Like, that's it. <laughs> you're like, what's well, around? Which is funny, too, because I before would either think I was always hungry, because right. I, I was always you're starving about stuff. That's it. Or I just didn't know what hunger felt like, because I had just made myself not... I would avoid any body cues. I, I ate yep. on, a, on a clock, not according to my body. So, yeah, today it's like... Some mornings I wake up and I don't eat until three. And then some days I'm like, I wake up starving. I'm like, well, I go hungry. Well, I'm going to go eat. Right. I do want to mention this though, because I, I think that when we talk, we talk about control and when I went to the eating disorder, or when I spoke about my eating disorder, they say a lot of it is about control, but I truly believe that part of it is really uh, avoiding something else. So we tend to obsess about something so we can avoid something else right and it's like what is that something else in our lives that we may be avoiding and maybe it is that not feeling good enough when we don't want to admit what that is and I think it can be very difficult to know and maybe there's not a specific thing but one of the things when Jill said that you you suddenly have this you basically have more space right you're not thinking about things all the time well now your mind is open to thoughts that maybe you were trying to not think about mm. And for me, when I stopped going to the gym, and I was going two to three hours a day. So it's a lot of your schedule, so, too. Yeah, I had, all, I had these hours to where when I was at the gym, I, could, I didn't have to think. So now I had this space, which was terrifying. These things that were coming up for me that I didn't even know. And I think one of the big things was, honestly, I was scared of my own potential. So there were things that I really wanted to do. I wanted to have a bigger impact. And for whatever reason, it was a fear of success, a fear of going out there. I think so many women have, I hear women say, I have a story and I want to do something big, but I'm so scared. And so instead of working on the thing that our soul wants us to do, we distract ourselves by dieting or getting ready, just distract ourselves. It's a distraction by focusing on the body, focusing on the food. So I, the first thing I did that really helped me, I actually, it's so random. There was a Groupon for a hypnotherapy and (laughs) she makes fun of me with my Groupons, but I actually wanted to go because I was having a really bad spat with my business partner and I was so anxious and angry and I really didn't believe in hypnotherapy, but I was so desperate. So I went and we did our first session and he taught me this technique called tapping EFT, emotional freedom technique. And one of my friend, Jessica Ortner and her brother, uh, Nick Ortner, they have books published by Hay House, The Tapping Solution, and it's to help with anxiety. And so he taught me a couple of tapping things and we'll link these in the show notes and some YouTube videos. But my very first hypnotherapy session, he taught me tapping first. He goes, when you feel anxious and when you're thinking about food or you're thinking about your business partner, you're going to do this. And so I left that first session. It helped me with my business partner, but then I ended up every time I was anxious about the food, I would do this tapping. And that helped me get through these uncomfortable pieces. Now, it didn't work every single time. Sometimes the anxiety was too much. But the tapping helped me a ton. So it might be a tool for people to use if they are trying to sit through it, but they're just, they're so anxious and they're so scared. Um, and the hypnotherapy, which again, I didn't believe in, and it's maybe it doesn't work for everyone. I do have an amazing friend, Grace Smith. She is actually launching a book this year. I don't know when it's coming out, but I will link it in the show notes for whenever it comes out. Um, it's called you close your eyes, get free. And she teaches you how to do self hypnosis. And I think these are things that can really help with the anxiety around when you're trying something new and you're so scared to let go of that control. I love that, and because so much of it is a mental game, mm-hmm. you know. So much is one of the things that really worked for me was just looking around and going like, okay, my life isn't changing. Like mm-hmm. I thought it was going to. I thought, you know, my friends would, you know, I thought my husband would leave me. I thought my yeah. friends would treat me differently. I, thought, I don't know. I'll get, I don't know, like fired my job or whatever. My actual day to day life didn't change at all. Mm-hmm. So it was really just my relationship with how I saw myself mm-hmm. was either, and I started to notice things like 
beating myself up, guilt, shame, self-disgust. I started calling myself out on that. So for me, I moved into one of the things that helped me tremendously was positive psychology, Mm -hmm. uh, the work of Sean Acor and the work of Tal Ben-Jahar, both of which talk a lot about perfectionism. And so for me, you know, I think both of us recovering perfectionists. And so a lot of wanting that control is about being quote unquote perfect. And so I will definitely link those books in the show notes. So I started reading, I started being and being like, wow, I never see myself as a perfectionist, but I'm they're scared of failure. They're scared to do anything that they're not sure they're going to be good at. All this kind of like self-limiting stuff. So I started really diving into those books and noticing. And then Brene Brown's work came later around shame and vulnerability and calling yourself out on some of that and the negative self-talk. And it really made self-compassion really amazing. To me, self-compassion is the tool to start changing the way that you're speaking with yourself. And so that was where some of the mindset component came in. But when it came to nutrition, Eating moderately looked, I use something called preemptive cheats. So this is the first part of, and I've been, I've been doing this since the beginning and teaching this preemptive cheats. It's just a word I made up, but it is another word for giving yourself some nutritional gimmies or nutritional relief throughout the week. Mm -hmm. So what I was noticing was I was doing something called the deprive and then binge cycle weekly. So I would deprive on Monday, I wake up, I'd feel so gross from a gross weekend of eating, wake up Monday morning and go, okay. This week, I'm going to do it super tight. I know what I'm going to eat. I'm going to feel in control again. I'm going to get all my food together. And Monday was fine. Tuesday, pretty good. Wednesday, I'm starting to get like a little bit sick of my food. I'm feeling like pretty good because I've been compliant for a couple days. I feel like maybe I need a reward. You know, maybe I'll be a little bit off plan on Wednesday. Thursday night, I'm like, okay. I go out to dinner Thursday night, eat whatever I want. Friday, it's like, okay. All bets are off. We're coming into the weekend. I remember literally leaving my job at five o'clock on Friday and going to the grocery store and getting like every sweet treat, chip, cookie thing that I wanted to have all weekend long. And I would just eat all weekend long. Sunday night, I would eat all the stuff in the house to get it out of the way so that yeah. Monday morning I could start over again. And I was doing this week after week after week. And I was like, at some point, I go, this is not working. I want it to work. Uh-huh. Every Monday morning, I wake up being like, oh, this is going to be the week. I'm going to stay on the plan. And I kept, and the evidence was that I, it wasn't yeah. working. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? I wonder if, if instead of having these on and off times, I can just give myself a little something so that I don't completely binge on Friday. And so I started giving myself things that I would consider healthy now, like protein bars and stuff like that. Yep. And I was having like little halves of protein bars and I was giving myself like a couple handfuls of nuts and I was putting cheese on my salad and I was using different condiments. And, and so I started using these things like having more breakfast meats and maybe meats and cheeses and things that I wasn't allowing myself to before I was having like a little bit of bacon on Monday or cheese on Monday or a glass of wine on Tuesday. And that stuff was really not, you know, on plan before then. And what I started to notice and not right away, but within a few weeks and within a few months, I wasn't binging as much on the weekends. I didn't feel the need to go to the grocery store and get all the stuff that I'd been missing all week or feeling deprived from because I was feeling a little bit more satisfied. And so preemptive cheats, three to four, five things that you would have, or at least this is the way I teach it, is that you kind of strategically place throughout the week. So that when it comes to Friday, if you're someone who tends to binge on the weekend or overeat or overindulge, that you feel a little more satisfied. And so that was a really hard kind of thing to break. Yeah. But over time, you get to the point where you do eat the same on Saturday that you do on Monday. I like the preemptive cheat idea, and it's not exactly the same, but maybe a little similar in that I would be so strict on everything, like, coffee, right? People go, mm-hmm. well, your cream and sugar makes all the difference. So then I would try black and I totally. hated it. And I <laughs> love coffee. And so I just decided, okay, if I'm going to eat mostly healthy, but I'm going to have my one thing or my two things. So if I'm going to eat healthy, I'm at least going to have cream and sugar in my coffee. And there's just little things like that. Or I'm going to eat healthy, but I'm at least going to have cheese on my salad or bacon on my salad. So it was just like giving myself just the small thing, I knew it wasn't going to blow the diet out of the water, but I had been so strict on everything that I was just giving myself those. And to this day, I will not drink black coffee. Yep. There's no way. I love that. And I think I like that the idea that you do have things that you are being discerning about. You're picking and choosing your nutrition battles, right? Because maybe for you, you're like, I could care less about chips or popcorn or sandwiches or whatever. That's not your thing, right? But your thing is, I want to cream my coffee. So it's about getting more discerning. I remember after my first show, I would eat like crackers, like and stuff that saltines, things that weren't even on my radar, yep. but because I now could have yeah. them, yeah. right? And so when it get, you have to kind of unlearn that blatant, that blanket, black and white way of doing things, and kind of go, okay, what are my non-negotiables? 
what are my things that I always want to have? And if I can just have those, it makes the rest of this a lot easier. Yeah. And so it goes back to the old adage of, you know, 80% clean, 20%, you know, kind of more yeah. satisfaction, more, I, I don't like to use the word like treat meals or cheat meals, but in a sense, because honestly, like that's just be part of your eating. Yeah. Um, but getting really discerning about which those things are going to be. And then the ones that you could take or leave, like, eh. and so it, it's a practice. It took me about three full years. Yeah. To go from all or nothing to just moderation 365, which is, again, eating the same on Saturday that you do on Monday. I love that you gave that timeline because I believe, I think a lot of people will see that and go, well, that sounds so easy, but it's to you guys, it's not easy. It's not. And it is a practice. And I would say probably about the same amount of time, three years. Yep. Yeah, about three years. Um, one thing that I did, I didn't even think about it till you were speaking. But because I struggled so much with my eating disorder for so long, and I would say the majority of my life uh, was with an eating disorder because I started when I was 13. So more of my life was not normal eating. And so I felt that I did not really know how to eat. So I would eat with people and I would mimic them. So I would sit with my husband because he didn't have any eating issues. And I would try to just watch what he was eating and eat and stop. So if he just stopped, because I would just want to keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he might not finish a meal. And I was like, oh, crap, I have to stop too. But it's, it might sound silly, but I literally would just watch people and copy them. It felt weird and I felt like a freak. But I had to just, I just didn't really know. I didn't know. So I would look at people who I felt didn't have any issues. And if I went out to dinner with somebody and I thought that they like didn't think about food the way I did, I would just, and it was, you know, I wasn't really present in the conversation. I was still obsessed at this point, but it was helping me learn how to actually eat. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I've actually never shared that and I just, I just recalled it. It makes complete sense because it's almost like you need a new template, right? Instead of having like the old meal plan template, it's kind of like, okay, how do I be a person who doesn't have food issues and mimic them? I love that so much. I think I was an all or nothing person. So Mm -hmm. the way I taught myself to be able to have a couple of chips and not eat the entire bag or eat a couple. Cause you know, we, we know this, we, it's the, what the hell effect. Yeah. You go, well, I'm already eating cookies, so I might as well just eat all of them now. Yeah. So the, what the hell effect is when you just throw your hands up and you're like, well, what the hell I'm already off plan. Might as well go all in, which is so stupid. If you think about it, it's like getting a crack in your phone and yeah. then like being like, well, this phone sucks and throwing it on the <laughs> ground and stomping it yeah. out. Right. Yeah. But we're so used to that black or white way of doing things. And so I taught myself how to have a couple bites of something without mm-hmm. having to polish it off. And like you and I travel a lot together. So it's hilarious because we'll just have half There's protein bars, bars <laughs> half protein cookies, like half little foods all over the place. Kind of gross, but we're all, and we're always just like taking little bites of stuff. Yeah. We should post a picture. I don't know if you could put pictures in the show notes, but we have like <laughs> bags of candy, like just little candies. We'll take two or three half open protein bars, like four or five. They're just, it will but just it's, last like a week. I yeah. mean, it's not like we just polish it off, but there's candy, just open bags of candy like not a lot of candy, but there's hanging out and we'll and walk I by and have a And I never would have been little... able to have that around no. before. I, w- I remember saying to like hide that from me or yep. don't have it in the house. Totally. I used to ask Jade to hide foods from me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me where it is. He'd forget where he put it. <laughs> Nate was six foot four, so he'd put stuff up really high that I couldn't reach and I didn't even know it was there. And later on, he, I heard him telling somebody he had Oreos and I'd go, you had Oreos at the house? But then I was so glad I didn't know because I right. I would have eaten them. All. I know. One of, <laughs> so one of the things that I used to teach myself how to do that, right? So have a little half protein bar, half this that is called the one fry roll. So my brother Danny, you guys maybe know, he came to live with Jade and I in 2011, and he he was 19 at the time, and as most 19 year olds do, they like eat burgers and fries. So we dine out quite a bit. So every time we went out to dinner, he would get burger and fries, and I would just go, I'm gonna take one fry. And I would take it off his plate Mm -hmm. and I would like douse it in ketchup or ranch dressing and I would eat it and be like, okay, it's so good. But even when I didn't want to have one, I forced myself to have one, right? And of course I could have had more, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have one and practice that. It sounds so stupid, but it is watching yourself be able to take one of something, Mm -hmm. just have that and then move on to my own meal, right? right? Then move on to my own meal. And so just the practice of that, getting into that, even if I didn't want it, forcing myself to kind of have it just so I could see evidence that I could, was someone who could handle that. So teaching yourself that mindfulness piece, that was one of the things I call this intermittent sampling. So like, you know, half protein bars, stuff like that, like little, take a little bit, leave, take yep. a little bit, leave, take a little bit, leave, and then practice that. So the outcome might be the same, right? We're going to eat the whole protein bar. We're going to eat that whole bag of candy by the end of the five days that we're here, but we don't eat all at once. 
You know, so the outcome's the same. Food's all gone, but we don't eat it all within like five minutes, yeah. right? We eat it over a time period. Similar to that, I had to get used to the idea of quote unquote wasting food. Yep. So this was very so juicy, very against my roles growing up. My grandfather was in the military and in the you know the depression and all that, and it's we couldn't waste food. We had to eat everything yep. off our plate before we couldn't even get up and like get away from the dinner table till we finished everything. And so to be able to walk away, I was so used to having to clear and clean my plate. So I started to either take smaller pieces or just literally as uncomfortable as us, scrape food into the trash can. And that was something that I practiced and I kind of did on purpose for a little while. Now I tend to be, I know Jill's more of, she'll throw more food away. I'll save it, but I just save it for the next day because right. I still have this, I still have a, a hard I still have a hard time wasting food. But the idea but, that but not funny, but putting it in your body isn't wasting right, it. Right, exactly. Well, this is this is what I was going to say about that is that that was what's so ridiculous is going, you're not wasting except you're putting it all in your body. Like you're just and you don't eating want it. all of the food that you don't want. And you don't want yes, it. Yes, yes. So it's so silly. It's really silly and it's very backwards. And it's it's one of those things where I still, I'll think about it before I either throw it away. or Like, do I really want this or is it? quote unquote, I'm eating it to not waste. And then that's when I'll throw it out. If I know that I won't like it again the next day, then I toss it. But if it's good food and I just don't want to waste it because I know I would actually enjoy it. But it is a really interesting thing too, seeing how people grow up because food wasting is a big reason why people struggle. Totally. And yeah, and I, and I get that. And so we always get, I always get people who are super sensitive. Anytime I talk mm-hmm. about this, people say, well, there's people starving in the world. And I'm like, yes, there are people starving in this city that we're in. Yeah. I get that. So you could do a couple things. You could provide food to a soup kitchen. Right. You could donate to someone who's doing that work. I have wasted a lot less food because I don't cook anymore. Uh-huh. So I don't know about you, but when, and I'm not saying, I'm not advocating people shouldn't cook. I know everyone, some of you like to cook and they have families and things like that. It's just easier for me not to. Yeah. But when I was cooking, prepping all my food, I remember being so disgusted by like mm-hmm. Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, I just like toss it. Or yeah. I would buy a whole bunch of stuff with the intention of making it yeah. and never end up making it. And then having to throw out so much food, I waste a lot less yeah. now because like you're, I'm just way more like mindful of what I'm actually going to eat. Yeah. I try to, start with smaller portions and then know that I can add more or have more sure. later. Although of course, you know, sometimes you end up waiting so long to eat and you go to a restaurant, you order so much and you go, why I should have just started with one thing, but it's, it's an interesting psychology and mm-hmm. thing to try to wrap your mind around. And we're going to talk about some money stuff too, but it's kind of the abundance mindset. Totally. Like there's enough. And Wayne Dyer said something like, you're not going to be able to eat enough food to feed the starving people in Africa. You won't be able to hurt enough to save someone else from hurting. So you can't, it's just because someone's starving doesn't mean the fact that you're not eating or throwing something away. That's not, it's not feeding them by, by you throwing something in the trash. So I love that. I love the abundance piece because I think we could do a whole episode on abundance in the way like having an abundance mindset versus a FOMO mindset. Maybe we'll save that for another episode. Definitely. But I loved what you said about ordering too much food. I call it surfing the disappointment. Mm -hmm. So like we, when we don't order all the things that we want to order, wait and see what comes and surf that like five, 10 minutes of disappointment of like, Oh, I wish I was getting more. I wish something else was coming or, and then just see how you feel. Yeah. And honestly, 99% of the time you're going to be so happy that you didn't order the other stuff or buy the other things. And look, you can always get more anytime, yeah. right? If you're at a restaurant, you want more food, you order it later. And so surfing that little bit of disappointment or, or declining the bread basket in that moment, you're like, Oh, it'd be great to have, but later on, you're like, you know what? I had the most amazing meal and I didn't need to have the bread or whatever. So it's picking and choosing and also just building up the evidence that you can do this stuff. Yeah. Right? This is a practice and you're not going to get it right, especially out of the gate. And if you're coming from a control mindset like Danny and I, you're not going to like the discomfort and the uncertainty of the kind of things that you need to endure at the beginning. Yeah. But I guarantee you it is so much worth it at the end of the day. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Um, Cassie Ho, she's the CEO of Blogilates and Popflex Active, amazing YouTuber. And she and I, I was on her podcast, Be Sheroic. We talked a lot about this too. And you guys can check out her podcast, the the episode I was on and listen to her story because she went through a very similar thing too. And she had public figure um, in fitness. So she struggled with 
like gaining weight on camera in front of her fans and people making comments. Yeah, we could just go underground. <laughs> yeah, we just yeah could hide, not post pictures, yeah. like post pictures from five years ago. But this is it's super juicy, and she went through some similar things that Jill and I did too, of just sitting in that discomfort and and taking a couple years to get to get there. Awesome. We'll definitely link that in the show notes. And I know that you have. Do you still have your adrenal stuff? Like a little, like a freebie or something like that for people oh. who are like, I don't know if you have. Yes. Because we want to just make sure you guys have a lot of resources because I know we're getting into, honestly, we could probably talk about this for like a whole, we probably should do a workshop or something, but we do have resources that we want to give you guys. Yeah. So I have a 14 day adrenal boot camp, which is really to help with people who have just over dieted because there does get to a place where you've done so much that you've basically blown out your, your ability to lose weight. You know, I've, I've talk to so many women who like me were doing all the right things and yet the scale will not budge or even the opposite they keep gaining doing the right thing they get their labs back their thyroid may or may not be off they can't figure it out and a lot of it has to do with adrenal burnout and so I created a um, 14 day and and when you open the 14 day you'll see the very first page is basically like this is going to take you more than 14 days but it's um, it's a reset and so that's definitely something yeah we can link and then Jill has her food obsession boot camp that's giving you these tools. I don't know if you were gonna mention anything. Yeah, so yeah, so if you guys will make sure we link this too because a lot of people are like, okay, great, but like how do I get started? What are the tools? Yeah. How, how do we actually start doing this stuff? Right? We can sit around and, you know, relate to one another on these food obsessive thoughts, but how do you actually if you are ready to make a change or even if you're not, kind of forcing yourself to start to move in the direction of moderation to mindfulness to abundance. The four week food obsession boot camp is a course it, like Danny said, it's not I mean four weeks, fourteen days, mm-hmm. not enough time. Four weeks is definitely not enough time to make that suit that switch. I would give yourself at least a year but all of the education all of the tools and plenty of stories so if you guys like the stories that Danny and I shared of like here's where you know here's what we did here's what you know those kind of very tactical things make sure that you guys check out the four-week food obsession boot camp it's open all the time Uh, we'll make sure that we link it in the show notes if you're interested in the actual tools and doing the work cool a lot. I know. It's so much. We could do like hours of this. I know. (laughs) Well, guys, give us some feedback. Make sure, um, obviously this, this content is a little bit different than the content that we posted so far. So we're interested in your feedback. Make sure you're joining us in the best life podcast on Facebook in the group. That's where the conversations are happening. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at the best life podcast and leave a review and make sure you subscribe as well. Thank you so much. We love you guys. All right. Bye.